Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. This is our second video on statistical power. In the first video, we had more of a kind of conceptual introduction and overview to what statistical power was. In this video, I wanna focus a little bit more on the actual calculation of a power analysis and specifically in the case of an independent samples t-test where we're gonna have one categorical factor as our independent variable and it's going to have two levels. So as an example, right, let's say we're gonna have a, a treatment group, we're gonna have a control group, and we're gonna have an experimental group. And to calculate an a priori power analysis, as we discussed in the previous video, we need to establish some minimal effect size of interest. What are we interested in trying to detect? And the most common way of doing this is getting a standardized effect size known as a Cohen's D. And Cohen's D puts the difference between the two groups in units of standard deviation. So to be able to calculate that, I'm actually going to need a mean and a standard deviation for each of my two groups. Uh, and then I can calculate the Cohen's D. So I'm just gonna make up some data here. Let's say that my Cohen's D uh, for the, or sorry, the mean of my control group is zero. Uh, and the mean of my experimental group is five. So the, the raw difference between these two things would be equal to the experimental group minus the control group, right? It is a five point difference on what, whatever uh, scale we're in. So I'll call that the raw difference. However, to calculate a standardized difference like a Cohen's D, what I need to do is take this raw difference and then standardize it uh, to some standard. And in this case, we will use the standard deviation. So if the standard deviation in each of our groups was one, Cohen's D would be equal to the difference divided by the pooled standard deviation. And the, the calculation of the pooled standard deviation is a little bit different than this, but we're just gonna kind of take a shorthand here and say that's the same as the average standard deviation. And again, the actual formula for pooled standard deviation is not this. You need to take like the size of each of the samples into account. But conceptually, we're just gonna say, ah, both these samples are the same size and we're gonna, we're gonna look at the average standard deviation. So we're gonna get a Cohen's D of five because having a scale difference of five when the standard deviation is one means that our groups were five standard deviations different. We can see obviously how this changes. For instance, if our standard deviations are five, now the average standard deviation is a five, so our Cohen's D is one. The same raw difference, a five point difference, translates into a difference of one standard deviation. So the Cohen's D is nice because it puts the size or the magnitude of our effect into units of standard deviation. Uh, and so you, these, these effects then will always depend on the exact question that you're trying to study. Uh, what is its scale? How variable are people? And how big of an effect do you expect? Uh, and oftentimes, this mean difference can be hard to determine. We might be able to get an estimate of the variability, but it's hard to say exactly what size of an effect do we expect, right? If we're testing a new drug, it's hard to say, well, how much is the drug going to change your blood pressure? So one of the things that we might do to calculate the smallest effect size of interest is instead, rather than using some mean difference from past literature, we'll use a minimal uh, clinically important difference. So for instance, if rather than five, let's say that some, some people who have worked in this field and have studied this dependent variable for a long time have said that two is the minimal uh, clinically important difference in our scale. So let's say for instance that these are ratings of pain. You have to be able to reduce a person's pain by two points on this scale before that really means something for them personally in terms of changing how they can perform and do the activities of daily living. So if the minimal clinically important difference is two, and I know that the standard deviation in my pain scale is a five, that translates into a Cohen's D of 0.4. So then I have a, a standardized effect size that I can use to actually do a power calculation. So next, we're gonna go into G-Power, which is a free power analysis software. And let's pull up G-Power um, to look at a, a, a two sample t-test. So we're gonna look at a, a t-test. We're going to scroll down through their multiple options to say this is the mean difference between two independent groups. And at the moment, we want to do an a priori power calculation. 
Now, in terms of our input parameters, the first thing we're going to do is switch this to a two-tailed hypothesis test because our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean difference between groups is zero. And then our alternative hypothesis is just that it is not zero, right? We're interested in whether it goes above or below. Any two-point change, right, is going to be meaningful. So we're interested in a two-tailed hypothesis test. Our effect size for our Cohen's D here, right, we said was actually 0.4. Our uh, alpha level is 0.05. Our power level by default is set to 0.95. In the previous video, we talked about 0.8 or 80% statistical power being a common standard. So let's change it to that. Uh, and now we're ready to actually do our a priori power calculation, right? So if what we're saying is we're gonna compare these two different groups, experimental and control, we want to have 80% statistical power to detect effects of 0.4, right? Cohen's D's of 0.4. And again, detect here is defined as declaring them statistically significant at the 0.05 level. So if we do that, you can see that we actually need 100 people in each group or 200 people total in order to have 80% statistical power um, for this effect size. We can see how changing some of these parameters influences you know, this calculation. Um, by adjusting the statistical power that we want. So for instance, keeping everything else the same, but going with 70% statistical power, I only want to be able to say with 70% confidence that I will declare effect sizes of 0.4 or greater statistically significant. Now you can see that the required sample size goes down. Rather than 100 people per group, I only need 79 people per group. And conversely, if I want a greater statistical power, right, so I want to be very sure that if I get an effect of 0.4 or greater, I'll declare it statistically significant, I could increase my power, and that's going to make my required sample size go up again, right? So the more power I want, that is to say, the more certain I want to be that I'll declare this effect statistically significant, I need more and more people. So like we said in the previous video, though, uh, an alpha level of 0.05 and a beta level of 0.2, which translates into a power level of 0.8, um, are standard. In a lot of grant applications or study designs, it is standard. But the exact level, kind of that ratio of alpha to beta, depends on your particular study design um, and the relative cost of false positive to false negative errors in that setting. For this particular effect, in this situation though, assuming we wanted an alpha of 0.05 and, a, and statistical power of 80%, we're gonna need 100 people in each group or 200 people total in order to reliably detect this effect. So if you're looking at that, you think, oh, it might be difficult to get 100 people. Maybe, for instance, in my study, it's expensive. Like every person I bring in, I don't have the money to bring in 100 people. I just have this financial constraint or some logistical constraint on my sample size. Another way that we can approach this problem is by doing what's called a sensitivity analysis. And in the sensitivity analysis, as we discussed in the previous video, we flip the problem around a little bit and we say, okay, enter your desired level of statistical power, enter your sample size, and then we'll tell you what kinds of effects you had the power to detect. So in this case, what we can say is, well, I can't get 100 people per group. I can actually only get 25 people for group for 50 people total. And if I do that, then you can see the only effects I would be able to detect are effects of size 0.8, right, or larger. So that's not great news, you know, if we assume that this is an effect of 0.4, because given my sample size, um, I, I only can reliably detect effects of 0.8 or bigger. Um, so you know, if I can only detect really big effects in this situation, what can I do? Well, for one thing, we can still run the study, but acknowledge the limitation on statistical power and say we were only powered to detect very large effects. So in the wake of a null result, you know, there very well could be a moderate effect of, of this intervention, but we lacked the power to detect moderately sized effects. We could only detect very big effects. The other thing you could do is through your study design, try to reduce some of the variability, right? So if we come back to our uh, spreadsheet here, right, this 0.4 depends on the standard deviation in our two groups. And is there a way to reduce the standard deviation, perhaps through 
um, you know, controlling for certain covariates or through actually having a more strategic sampling procedure. And we're going to restrict our inclusion and exclusion criteria to reduce the variability between people. Because for instance, if I can cut this standard deviation down from a, a five to let's say a 0.25, or sorry, a 2.5, now, right, ah, look, the, the actual effect I can detect is 0 0.8, right? So, so then you could say, well, if I can actually improve the size of this effect relative to the variability to an, a large enough degree that I can get the Cohen's D of 0.8, I could reliably detect this with 25 people. So the sensitivity analysis, I think, is a really uh, helpful way to approach some of these problems when sample size is logistically constrained or when the true effect is just very unclear, right? You might feel like you don't have good enough information to base these assumptions on mean differences or standard deviations, and it just feels very wishy-washy. So maybe rather than commit to a single a priori power calculation with some unjustified assumptions, what you could do is a sensitivity analysis and then you could actually look at a range of different values using this x, y plot for a range of values feature in, in g power. On our y axis, we can put the effect size d as a function of, then on the x axis, the total sample size. And we can go from 10 to 100 in steps of 5. And if we draw that plot, then what, we'll show, uh, we'll, what it will show us is the effect sizes that we can detect with 80% statistical power um, as a function of the total sample size. So when I only have 10 people per group, um, sorry, or when I only have 10 people total, five per group, I can only detect massive effects. I could only detect groups that are two standard deviations different. If I have 20 people total, right, 10 per group, then I can still only detect quite large effects, but it's, it's better. I can detect the groups that are 1.3 standard deviations different. And then once I hit, you know, about 50, um, I, I'm, I'm at least under one standard deviation. I can detect so things of size 0.8. If I get to 100 people total, I'm, you know, 50 in each group, I'm getting closer to detecting effects of a more moderate size of about half a standard deviation. So this is a useful way then of thinking about, given this constraints on my sample size, what could I reasonably detect? And then you can either include that in the limitations of your study, if basically that's the sample size and that's all you can do, or it can force you to reflect on, well, what could I do to attempt to make this mean difference a little bit bigger or make this standard deviation a little bit smaller, right? Is there something I can do to make my manipulation stronger or is there something I can do to remove variability in order to collectively, you know, improve that standardized effect size and increase the statistical power in my study?